Good evening. I am Karen Taylor, Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. And I'm so pleased that you can be here this evening for the second in our series of four lectures. The lecture series is entitled um, Labor, Literature, and Landmarks. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction and apologies to you, to many of you who may have heard these words before. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York was founded in 1785. We are a nonprofit organization that continues to serve and improve the quality of life of the people of New York City through our educational and cultural programs. These programs include our tuition-free Mechanics Institute, which actually uh, just returned to class this week, the General Society Library, which celebrated 200 years, um, two years ago, and of course, of which our in-person audience are sitting in tonight, our John M. Mossman Lock Museum, and again, for the in-person audience, please feel free to visit the uh, Mossman Lock Collection, which you can just see up there um, after our talk tonight. And finally, our lecture series, of which, of course, tonight is part of. Our lecture series uh, follows a proud tradition of lectures that, was found, uh, that started in 1838. For our online audience, please feel free to submit type questions throughout the lecture through the Q&A section, rather than raise your, um, sorry, and of course, at the conclusion of the talk. We would ask that you use the Q&A section rather than raise your hand. Uh, for our in-person audience, um, we ask that you keep your questions until the conclusion of the talk, the Q&A uh, section. Now, it is such a huge pleasure tonight to introduce to you someone who is renowned in the subway and transport community for his knowledge and expertise on the New York subway. Peter Doherty. Tonight, Mr. Doherty will discuss his annually produced book, Tracks of the New York City Subway. Um, this project started for Mr. Doherty as a high school project on urban transportation in the mid 1970s and became a lifelong interest and passion for the author, as he will now explain. I ask you to join me in giving a warm welcome to Peter Doherty. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. And uh, a great big thanks to Karen for extending an invitation uh, for me to address this gathering this evening. As someone who should never ever be issued hand tools and being neither a mechanic nor in the trades, I was pleasantly surprised to receive an invitation to make this presentation on my ongoing work, uh, Tracks of the New York City Subway. And if I can get the uh, clicker to work here. Um, yeah, the 1960s and in a very far off land, Montreal, Canada of all places. My parents' house was on the West Island of Montreal, about five miles away from the, uh, the international airport. And the airport was there and I was located there. And this is relevant in ways that'll come along in a couple of moments. Um, the only way to really get around, this was a car-centric community. It was either the family car and the occasional bus that may or may not show up if and when it ever felt like doing so. Commuters going, town, uh, going downtown, uh, like my dad, would either drive in, which the majority of people would do, or they would take a, a commuter train that, again, might show up whenever or not it felt like doing so. I never rode it and uh, my dad drove me everywhere. So I was really immersed in car culture. And uh, later when I went to school, of course, was the bus. And so, you know, the whole idea of trains just never really did anything. I, but I quickly, uh, where I was living, there were not a whole lot of youngsters and I was rather unique, shall we say. I didn't make friends all that easily. I was an only child. So I quickly learned to develop an interest in what made things work. I was a tinkerer. I love taking stuff apart. I never got it back together, but I love taking it apart. 
And even as a toddler, this sense of curiosity always grew. So fast forward a, a couple of years, and I'm still, this is still before I get into school. I think the, the most meaningful gift my parents ever gave me at the time was a transistor radio. I'd listen to far off stations at night under the covers and then look at the map the next day. Remember, I'm four or five years old looking at the map the next day to see where New Orleans or Chicago, Nashville, Memphis, and St. Louis were. In Montreal at the time, we only had four English language radio stations, and uh, they were only the only ones we could hear during the day. But at night, when propagation changed, I could listen all across North America. It was wonderful. Locally, there was hockey, Vive la Canadien, by the way. But after dark on that radio, there was basketball, there was American football, baseball in the summer, music of every kind. Radio from that early age shaped who I became. A few years later, many years later, as an amateur radio operator, I met many of my closest friends and even indirectly, my wonderful and glorious wife who's sitting in the audience here this evening. Uh, I met her through uh, conferences that a ham radio friend of mine got me interested in going to. So this has been, radio has been fundamental in what I did. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. That little transistor radio had more in it than just the broadcast bands though. It had public safety bands and more importantly, aircraft. As I said, I lived just a couple of miles away from Montreal International Airport in Dorval. And I could hear the control tower and the controllers and the pilots and everything back then. So soon after I discovered the aircraft band, I stopped listening to WCBS and WRNO, KMOX, WSM, and all the big class A's. And instead I was listening to Dorval Tower and clearance delivery and ground control, listening to them give the clearances to the airplanes going off to those wonderful cities and even Los Angeles and London and Rome and places I couldn't even pronounce or find on a map if I had to. I'd listen to them giving taxi instructions to the departure runway. But here's where this all started to come into focus. For example, ground control would give a clearance, something like Air Canada 801 taxi to runway 28 via Bravo and Delta. Okay, what did Bravo and Delta mean? I didn't know that, I was just wrong. So the seed was planted. I had no idea. I knew Air Canada 801 was a DC-8 and I knew it was going nonstop to Vancouver because I had the timetable, but I didn't know what a runway 28 was and I didn't know what a Bravo and Delta were. I just started school at the time and when most kids were fascinated collecting hockey cards, playing hockey, watching hockey, listening to hockey, I was listening to airplanes, discovering just as much about those big noisy jets as I possibly could. In an age with no internet, no Google Earth, and just a modest library full of English literature and meager children's book section, there wasn't any real way for me to find out what those strange incantations were coming from the ground controller. Sensing their kid was rather um, eccentric, my parents managed to get me into the control tower. I was literally on top of the world when they did that. <laughs> Uh, the controllers pointed out taxiways, Bravo, Delta, runway 28, runway six left, two four right, zero six right, two four left. And they gave me a taxiway diagram to follow as I listened every afternoon and evening. Pretty soon I had the entire airport layout memorized. I wanted to know every runway and taxiway at every other big airport, Toronto, Vancouver, JFK, and the granddaddy of them all, Chicago O'Hare, which was something even back then. I had to know where all the taxiways went and even created my own fictional airports on paper. My attention to detail was coming in to a very sharp focus. But about that time, something momentous happened in Montreal, the 1967 World's Fair known as Expo 67. As I said earlier, we lived in a car-centric community and I'd never been on a train in my life. Dad drove us all to Expo one day and we got on board the Expo Express. I think you see where this is going. <laughs> I was hooked. I became absolutely enchanted. Like the airport runways, I had to know where the tracks went. I had to know where all of the tracks went. 
few weeks later, my dad took me back into the system and we opened the newly opened Montreal Metro system. My eyes must have been this big. I saw trains running below the ground. How was this possible? The seed had been planted and it grew rapidly from there. As I went through grade school and junior high, my fascination with both airplanes and trains grew. I not only drew fictitious airports, but fictitious subway systems as well. My parents and teachers were once again convinced I was nuts. I'll lead you to see where that one's going too. I guess I was, but in a good way. So I called and wrote to the Montreal Transit Agency and eventually I got through to their engineering department. I'm probably about nine or 10 at the time. I made friends with various engineers and transit officials asking them for track plans, et cetera. And I found one kind senior engineer who gave me tunnel plans and track engineering plans to the entire system. We're talking about give, giving a kid the key to Fork Knox or a candy store and telling them, have at it. So it was an amazing thing. As a family, we never traveled. So as much as I envisioned those far off places when I listened to the airplanes in Dorval, I never once made it outside of about a 60 mile radius from home. But knowing my interest in subways and rail, my dad told me about this strange and wonderful place called New York City and the subway system therein. Of course, I could have made a drawing of JFK and LaGuardia uh, runways and taxiways by hand at the time, but neither here nor there. He said that for as interesting as our Montreal Metro was, the New York City subway was so much more complex and fascinating. And he promised me when I was older, we'd visit it. I couldn't wait to be older. Fast forward a few years, I think I was about 12, give or take. And for our social studies class, we were assigned a project on, well, I don't rightly remember what the assignment was, but we got to choose the subject. Once again, I think you see where this is going. I had all my track plans and train specifications for the Metro ready to go, but something reminded me of my dad's telling me how much more impressive the New York City subway was than our piddling little Metro. So I wrote and even called the track department of the New York City Transit Authority. Eventually I got to uh, chatting with someone who understood what I was asking for and was, and well, he promised to send me something that might be able to help. Okay, this is great. In about two weeks, I got this package in the mail. Well, check that, it was a huge package. In it were cross sections and plan views of tunnels and L tracks, about a dozen aerial photographs of yards and the piece de resistance, a 10 foot long blueprint of the entire track network. 10 feet and about an inch. It was dated July 1st, 1940 and revised to 1967. To a train obsessed preteen, this was winning the Super Bowl or as we called it back there, the Great Cup. I did my presentation, bored the entire class with the details, but I got an A on research for the research. We'll leave it at that. With the project over, I soon moved on to other interests as high school progressed. That big map was something I'd unfold and try to memorize every time I was bored. I took it on vacations for rainy, rainy days up at the cottage and I watched as my friends rolled their eyes as I showed it to them on the, on the uh, picnic table in the backyard. I finally did make it to New York and on my own when I was 16 years old, and this would be in the, I think 75, 76, somewhere in there. And I finally got to see this system firsthand. It was real. It was gritty, it was dirty, it was loud, and it was exciting in a way that the Metro could never be. And I loved every single minute of excitement that my 35 cent token would afford me. But soon going to school, earning a living, and my newfound love of CB radio, it was the 70s, what can I say? And then amateur radio took hold and I put the map away for a while as life happened. I moved from Montreal to Toronto, and I got into the movie business. Oops. Yeah, that was really me. You know, I had a wonderful and financially rewarding career that lasted just shy of 25 years. It was the best job that ever was or ever will be. 
changeovers every 20 minutes, watching every movie from upstairs and all the technical stuff that went on, learning the, uh, the mechanism to operate this wonderful device. It, it, was, it was wonderful and I loved the job. I tried to hire on to the Toronto Transit Commission as a subway driver, but you had to start that career as a bus operator and I never even got an interview. And likewise, I tried to hire on to Canadian National, but that too never really went anywhere. In uh, 1994, I managed to hire on to Canadian Pacific as a trainman and uh, locomotive engineer uh, uh, trainee. Guess who redrew all of the yard and terminal siding plans in a way that everybody in my training class could better understand? The economy faltered, however, and a couple of years later, my entire class of Canadian Pacific was furloughed indefinitely. We were then given a choice, move across the country to work for BC Rail in Northern British Columbia for two years, or be let go effective immediately. Since I had just begun a long distance relationship with the most amazing woman I'd ever known, I grudgingly left the railroad and went back to the projection room, unfortunately. During that time, the internet was gaining in popularity and I soon found a website called nycsubway.org. And I think probably a lot of people, if you're transit fans, you know about that subway or that uh, website uh, run by Dave Pierman. Even back then, it was an amazing resource uh, when the web was brand new. Soon I had an idea. I had an old IBM XC computer and a Logitech four inch hand scanner and a 10 foot long track map. Or to put it more into scale, something closer to that. It took me several weeks and no end of messing around in the photo editing program. Uh, I was using Photoshop and before Photoshop, uh, I think it was Photoshop Elements, I couldn't tell you which, uh, to stitch all those together as best I could, color them in and offer them to the uh, New York City subway, uh, NYC subway website to give something back to the rail fan community, which was essentially in its infancy back then. And I figured there must be a few other track fans out there and if I could help them with their own projects, then I would be pretty happy about that. But a funny thing started happening. I was getting requests, many requests, to compile these maps into a bound publication that people could carry around with them when they too rode the system and looked out the front of the trains. I used to be able to do that back then, of course. This was in the days, of course, before smartphones and tablets, and a spiral bound book would be just the thing. By 1996, it took me a few weeks of messing around with Quark Express on my girlfriend's Mac when I went to visit her. Oh, did I mention she lived in New York City at the time? Convenient, uh, on the Upper West Side. I eventually got a bunch of copies run off at the local uh, copy shop, and I ordered, uh, uh, offered them for sale for, I think, either 10 or $15, maybe 20, I'm not sure. Uh, but it was a trivial amount. The first printing was extremely sparse and was only about 24, uh, 24 or 25 pages. Uh, no notes, no nothing. It was just the bare tracks and not a whole lot else, the stations and the lines. Um, this, these were photographed from the very first book that ever came off the press, which I kept for myself. I, I kept two of them. One I gave to my girlfriend at the time now my wife and the other one I kept for my library. So this is what the, the first couple of pages of that very first book actually looked like. And the horizontal pages. So a lot of it kind of looked the same as it did later on, but uh, I flushed it out much more. But I did quickly discover that I wasn't the only fan of track maps. And I was constantly updating and reprinting. Soon it was somewhere around 1998. I'd gone down to New York from my home in Toronto every other weekend. And at one point, a now, uh, now retired transit worker escorted me into the old IRT City Hall station, the uh, BMT City Hall station on the lower level, and the abandoned upper level station at Myrtle Avenue Broadway uh, out in Brooklyn. And that was wonderful. Another very kind person escorted me around a couple of the IND yards uh, and many, many photos were taken, however, the negatives got lost over the years. I suspect there might be buried under a pile of rubble somewhere around a closet that says beware of the leopard on it or something like that, but they're, uh, they're no longer anything I can find in the house. I wrote an introduction to the book uh, for the second edition that explained the basics of the system 
since I started to notice that many people from outside of the New York City region were buying the book. In 2000, I, mar I got married and emigrated to the United States and took up residence in Maspeth, Queens for a few years. The book remained popular and after the 9-11 attacks, I needed to constantly update what was open and what remained closed. I was writing and printing on demand and new uh, editions or new versions were coming out roughly every six to eight weeks through the space of about two years. As the years went on, I always was tinkering and updating as new tracks open, old ones closed, and new proposals were made for uh, what was to come later on. My research got more and more in depth and, uh, excuse me, I have to refer to a note here. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, I started adding more and more details as things went on. Around that time, a rail fan that I'd gotten to know online had three books of track plans that I was welcome to have if I came and got them, which I obviously did. We were a series of plans from the 1970s era called the General Signal Arrangement or Single Line Drawings. With the aid of these drawings, I began to add home signal numbers and indications for diverging route home signals to the book. And I finally had a way to include yard maps as well. More years passed and I moved from Queens to New Jersey and I changed my layout software uh, from Quark Express to Adobe InDesign, which was the most amazing change in the production of that book you could ever imagine. I edited the maps though in Photoshop. That wasn't the best program in the world to do this in, but it was good enough and I didn't have the time to redraw the system in a better format. The two programs also played quite nicely together and they allowed me to create the necessary PDF files that my printer needed, which was always problematic in the old Quark Express days. I, I remember saying words that could make a sailor, sailor blush, fuse copper wires and lose the war for the allies anytime I tried to send a book to press. It, it was unbelievable. <laughs> when my uh, lovely wife volunteered to convert from Quark Express and she'll, she'll know about that, about that profanity part. You know, I was scaring the cats. It, it was like that. Uh, she volunteered to uh, convert into the InDesign format, which she used in her job. And the sailing was exponentially smooth ever since. I started to fill up the white space on the map pages with detailed inserts of complex interlockings. And I expanded the introduction section with high level overviews of power distribution, signaling, the radio system, and abandoned stations. I went to an annual release schedule in 2010 rather than the, uh, the version system. And ever since new books uh, have come out in the late fall, usually around or before Thanksgiving. More and more details were added and the introduction expanded to about 40 pages. Uh, prices did creep up as the work expanded, but I tried to keep it as low as I could. In November, 2019, after the release of the 2020 edition, I started to experiment with converting the mainline track maps from Photoshop's uh, pixel format to Adobe Illustrator's vector format. It's a style I'd been using for the close-up maps for a few years, but not on the mainline tracks. It was really pretty slow going and I wasn't sure I was ready to commit to so much work. But in March, 2020, the world changed and pandemic lockdowns made it obvious that I'd have nothing but time on my hands for the foreseeable future. So I decided to jump into the map conversion process wholeheartedly. In the following months, I uh, redrew the system in its entirety. And since it was all with vector art, it was trivial to change colors with a single mouse click and the editing path of a track it was just a matter of dragging a couple of vector handles rather than drawing it freehand with uh, with pixels. The next couple of slides will kind of describe the process a little bit better. Here you can see that the tracks themselves and nothing else, no station names, line numbers, no yards, nothing else, just the mainline tracks were drawn in Adobe Illustrator. As, if, for those of you who know the system, you'll recognize that that's East New York Yard is up there and the Livonia Yard is located right down here. 
Those would be added later in production, but just the mainline tracks and stations and um, non-revenue tracks, connections, and so on would be done in InDesign. The tracks within Adobe Illustrator, I'm sorry, uh, the tracks within Illustrator can be manipulated very easily. This is once again, that, that same uh, area that you saw in the previous slide, but it shows how I can isolate an individual path and the various handles, you just move them to and from, and you're playing with uh, Bezier curves essentially in wireframe mode. So everything becomes a little object like that that you can manipulate and move very, very easily which you could not do with uh, uh, Photoshop and pixels and uh, what they call the raster format. Switching back to InDesign, the formatting for the book, page sizes, frames, margins, et cetera, are defined ahead of time. And then the Illustrator files are placed into a page at the desired level of magnification. Since these are now vector-based files, I can enlarge or reduce the scale of each page with no loss of image quality, something that was just not possible to do with Photoshop. As you can see, I added various symbols and so on and so forth. Every bit of text was added after the fact in Adobe InDesign. I worked straight through from about August 2019 until uh, late 2020, often putting in 70 or 80 hours a week. I lived and breathed this new format until I got things exactly the way I wanted them to be. It was quite frankly, grueling work at times. Color printing costs a lot more than black and white, so I did have to increase the price, but I managed to keep it as best I could and still have a few dollars left in my cigar and scotch fund and to keep Uncle Sam happy. The uh, diagram at the left will also show you the difference between the pixelated uh, Photoshop format and the new vector format. And as you can see, the difference in quality is better by an order of magnitude. By now, the, the, the book was about as good as I could get it and still keep to my philosophy of only putting in current tracks and describing future plans. Until then, I had always said I wouldn't venture into historical track maps, but as the pandemic kept things buttoned up, I started uh, in on the old Brooklyn elevators. Since there are still quite a few remnants of those L's in existence, I figured I'd tie that into the, uh, into the existing system just as a logical progression and add a, a little bit more content for uh, the next year. Drawing the L tracks was straightforward, but soon after that, the enormity of what I'd undertaken caught up with me. When drawing historical maps, the biggest question becomes, from what point in time? For Brooklyn L's, I chose two time periods. First, the one you can see on the left, um, yeah, the one you can see on the left was from the mid 1930s before the, uh, the loop at Sand Street closed and service began to cut back. The second was from after the Fulton Street L closed in 1956 in the section from Rockaway Avenue to Lefferts Boulevard. I also researched and added the South Brooklyn Railway and its industrial sidings along 37th Street and McDonald Avenue, uh, the various rights of way and the interchanges at Coney Island Yard and west of Bush Terminal. This is the, uh, the Eastern portion uh, you see on the screen here now, 37th Street had a number of industrial sidings. Uh, it's all uh, housing blocks there now, but uh, managed to find the plans for those. And then it went down uh, McDonald Avenue underneath the F train on the surface and terminated in, uh, in uh, Coney Island Yard into a section that's no longer used. Last spring, I was contacted by Steve Quazzo, a reporter from the New York Post, who had come across my track map book and was intrigued by all the little nuances and details. He interviewed me in Midtown on my 60th birthday, and about two weeks later, an amazing two-page spread was published. Interest in the book took off, and after that, and in addition to the nice sales boost I got, more people were able to contribute material and suggestions than ever before. What I figured was going to be a you know four part four paragraph item below the spread behind the obituaries on page 96 turned into the center spread of the New York Post in July of 2021. It was probably the proudest day of my professional life. And that framed photograph that you see here is uh, hanging on the wall behind my desk and it reminds me of something truly amazing and truly wonderful. And my slides are out of order. 
All right, I'm gonna to have to wing this. So if you'll excuse me for just a moment here, I have to go back to my manual notes. My apologies, I should be able to vamp for time, but I've never been very good with that. Let me go back just a little bit here. All right. I discovered one very, very big thing with all of this. While I'm pretty good at drawing track maps, my grasp of historical operations was, shall we say, somewhat lacking. Since I use root colors, in this case, made up of, made up of whole cloth using existing line colors for continuity, I had to color the station platforms and tracks in the appropriate colors as chosen for each of the lines from that point in time. One of my longtime contributors really stepped up to the plate and hit it out of the park. And I cannot say a big enough thank you to Constantin Stefan, who is an excellent historical research and has a tremendous eye for detail. Unfortunately, he cannot be here tonight, but I can say unequivocally that if it was not for his tireless efforts and my Brooklyn historical maps from the current year's book would have been nowhere near as accurate. I've also had many tremendous contributions from a young man about as old as I was when I was knee deep into my big map. And he helped me flush out the details, uh, certain details like tunnel bell, bell mouths and unbuilt provisions of the system. And I would like to personally take the time to thank a gentleman by the name of Shaul Picker for his vast understanding and knowledge of the transit system. And like Constantin has, been a, has this wonderful ability to research the more obscure topics and find out tidbits that your humble scribe would never be able to suss out on his own. The biggest question I kept being asked by regular and new readers is when are you going to publish track maps of the old IRT Manhattan and Bronx elevators? Since unlike the Brooklyn and Queens uh, lines there are only couple of very tentative remnants left of the IRT elevated. So I didn't know how those would be relevant to a work whose focus is the current tracks, but the requests were soon too frequent to ignore. And after the 2020 book came out last year, I went straight into the 2023 edition that will be released in approximately six weeks time. Once again, Constantin came up huge and we managed to correct a lot of the details that I had initially gotten wrong. We fine tune track curvatures and placements, look through historical photographs and from archives to determine the location of towers, crossovers, yard leads, platform offsets, and so on. Old maps from the Jay Bromley company from the turn of the century played a big part. And this is such a map here. For example, this was the old Third Avenue elevated that came up here and you can cross, you know, with the Deegan that just started. But this had shown up uh, back from as early as I think the late 1800s in the various incarnations of the Bromley maps ever since. And uh, they have been a tremendous help. The other thing that was a, a, just an amazing find was an aerial map of New York City from 1924. And uh, flashed it earlier, it was this. This is unbelievable. The level of detail that was able to be achieved from that airplane in 1924 defied my imagination. And I was able to use that, for example, this is up here, the path of the Ninth Avenue elevated, and then the Sixth Avenue L goes up here, the Second and Third Avenue L through Puente Slip, and so on. And I was able to use that resource to map out the entire elevated network, and it went all the way up into the Bronx, and between that and the Bromley map, I was able to get that exactly the way I wanted. And uh, later on in the presentation, in the slideshow, you'll see uh, exactly what the, the new version looks like. And it, it's pretty remarkable. To round out the historical section, I managed to find close up track plans of long gone elevated yards, marker lights, service patterns, and even signal plans from the Third Avenue L. With over 2,000 hours of research, drawing, and annotating done, it was now time to update the text with an expanded signaling section and an overview of how the new CBTC signaling system works. More photos were added to the book, and an index was added for the first time ever that will once again appear in just a few weeks from now. 
I created uh, marker light -like guides, so those little colored lights that used to be on top of the old trains that tell the uh, tower operators which switches to throw as a train was approaching. And whether trains were local express, local express, or through express, and so on. I find that one to be absolutely fascinating as well. This is an actual image of the plan of the Lexington Avenue line north and south of Grand Central. It includes every single detail that would make the book unreadable to all but signal experts if I tried to publish it. The pages are also about 11 by 17 in size. So there's no way I could, I could realistically make something like this work. So my job was to take the information from these various pages and distill it down into a format that was far more readable. This is the same area of track, but colored in, simplified, and the only signals that I show are the, uh, the facing point interlocking signals that you would see before taking a switch that could either go straight ahead or diverge off into a different route. I show uh, switches, double slip switches, and so on. And uh, for example, up here, you can see the lead to the, uh, the Times Square shuttle, uh, number one track, and so on. So it doesn't contain as much information as this, but I think it's far more readable. And that is the majority of the um, uh, type of work that I, uh, that I do. The one thing that has uh, been mentioned to me on several occasions is security. How can I publish something like this? Isn't this giving the bad guys information. Well, the vast majority of information in these pages can be found out just by going on to Google Earth, nycsubway.org, and books that have been in and out of print since the subway first opened in 1904. I don't have anything in there that would let a bad guy do anything unthinkable. So it is what it is. But again, the years progressed and I made changes adding various and sundry levels of detail. So what's next? Well, that's an excellent question. I honestly don't know the answer to it yet. Every year since 2016, I've been adding more and more detail. And with the upcoming 2023 edition, I intend to focus on keeping the work up to date, but I have no immediate plans to expand the book any further, at least for a couple of years. I think I'm going to spend a little more time going camping, playing in the rocks on my Jeep, and enjoying the occasional cigar. One final note. Following the presentation, I have a few signed books with me and uh, coupons for 25% off the 2023 edition once uh, pre-orders start being accepted on the website after October 10th. I'd like to thank everyone here this evening and those who have joined in on Zoom. It's been my, uh, my pleasure and an absolute honor to present here this evening. And I hope I've been able to provide you with a bit of a glimpse into what has motivated me, what has motivated me to keep this work alive and keep it going for all these years. During the Q&A that's about to follow, I'm going to just let a slideshow go. And uh, this will show many of the pages that, are, uh, that nobody has ever seen before other than Constantine and my wife, that are going to appear in the uh, 2023 edition. So with that, let's uh, open it up to Q&A. Any there. Thank you so much. That was absolutely tremendous. Thank your you. enthusiasm, your expertise, your diligence. It was, it's an incredible, it's a really such a wonderful story. I'm going to say a bit more at the end, but I will now open it up to Q&A. And I think, Corey, do you want to add something before I? Okay, well, I'll start with our executive director with the first question. Peter, thank you. That, I mean, a visual treat. I mean, it's brilliant work. And from a native New Yorker, you're a treasure. Thank you so much for oh, choosing I, I New York. I don't know how to respond to that. That's, no. that's Thank humbling. you for selecting and... New York. So to that, I have to say a couple of things. When you came when you were 16, did you stay with family? How? Because that, that's a big deal at 16 years old. And then 
uh, when you first relocated here or located here and selected Mass Path Queens, was it because of the subway line? Or I don't know, what attracted you to that town? And do you have a favorite subway line? Mine's hmm. the A, because I grew up in Inwood, so. <laughs> I've always been a BMT kind of guy myself. I, I, was, I was fascinated not so much by the BMT that exists today. The BMT are usually the later letter, lettered lines. Uh, the A through, F, uh, A through G were the IND, and the rest of them were the, uh, the BMT. However, now anything can run over anybody's tracks, and that's all highlighted in the book. Um, where did I stay? I stayed at a Ramada Inn on 8th Avenue, just below 50th Street. I was, uh, I was a pretty tough kid. I, no, I wasn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, I could handle myself, though. And, uh, you know, I, I, was, I had some uh, street savvy from the mean streets of Point Claire, Quebec. Um, I was attending a journalism. I, I wanted to be a, a journalist for some stupid reason. Um, I gave that up. Quite, uh, quite soon thereafter, but uh, Columbia University had a high school journalism uh, symposium every year that lasted three or four days, and I went down with that. And um, when I wasn't going to the, to the symposium and uh, the lectures, I was riding the subway the whole time, and that was far more interesting to me than anything that was going on up at Columbia, which is probably why I'm just a guy who writes books now and not a PhD from Columbia. So. I don't know. And, and you had a, a second, another question that I can't remember. Mass Pep Queens. Mass Pep Queens. We, and Peter, just to, to add to that, and I promise the audience will be able to ask this, but do you have a problem with people who call it the green line? I mean, as a native New Yorker, I, I personally. Depends on which green line you're talking care about. For, There's four of them. I just, I, I'd say the four, five, or six, but the green line, or the, you know, the, you know, the yellow line I, I just don't, I don't yeah it, it, it yeah. bugs me too i mean every other city has got those new york has got the one the two the three the a the G. my wife has a has a, a nice little anecdote about that that she told me about that uh somebody was coming into her office once and they had gotten lost and uh they made contact by telephone and said well where are you she said i'm on the brown line <laughs> she didn't even know what the brown line was I don't think at the time anybody would want to know where the brown line was. <laughs> it's a lot better now, of course, the, the J and Z in Brooklyn. <laughs> and why Massbeth? Because I couldn't afford to live in Manhattan. <laughs> I think that was, that was the easiest part. Right, I'm going to take um, an, uh, an online question. This is from Robert. What is an unused center trackway? An unused center trackway is exactly what its name sounds like. You have two tracks running, let's say a northbound and a southbound. Whoops, I shouldn't hit the microphone, that's bad. Um, a northbound and a southbound, but there's a provision for a third track that may have once been installed a long time ago, or it may have been planned, but never included. But the provision is there, the, the physical space is present. So if somebody someday ever wanted to put a third track in, that's what that trackway is. Give me. Um, so the new edition, um, another online question, has I'm, all the earlier editions in that. Sorry, can you hear me? Sorry, I, I, Karen, can you come up? I can't yes, hear. Sorry. I didn't bring my hearing aids today. Sorry about that. Does the new edition have all the earlier editions in them? Yeah, I, I build on the old work every year. The only thing that's ever taken out uh, are uh, things that have gone away after a few years. And I, I don't even do that anymore. What I now do is put a note that says, you know, this existed here and was removed in whatever. And the new book is going to focus quite a bit on that. So, you know, there used to be a switch here and it was removed after uh, X number of years or removed in December 1949 or whatever it was. But I generally like to build upon what has come before and just add new material. I never really like taking stuff out. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we've got some in-person questions, and we do. Hi, I'm very novice at this, but I was just wondering why. I am too, so that's okay. <laughs> I, I don't think so. 
why are some trains letters and some trains numbers? That is an excellent question. And it's a, a little bit convoluted. The original subway opened by August Belmont in 1904 ran from City Hall to Harlem, and it used uh, trains of a certain size. You'll notice that the IRT, the, uh, the, the numbered lines, the trains only have three doors per side and they're a little bit narrower. So what had happened, the IRT expanded and expanded over the years. Dual contracts were signed in around 1913, but the IRT was built to this physically smaller standard. The BMT, at the time it was called the BRT, the Brooklyn Rapid Transit, they used a completely different standard and they built their lines out in Brooklyn. And eventually they ran a couple of lines into Manhattan and they operated just simply as the IRT and the BMT. In uh, 1932, I believe it was, or 1933, the IND, the Independent opened up and they used the same technical specifications as the BMT. So you had the IRT lines that were all by themselves and they were in Manhattan and the Bronx mostly with a little bit into, into Brooklyn. And you had the IND and you had the BMT, which were together. So when they decided they were, uh, at, at the time the, uh, the, BM, the BRT and later the BMT, they actually used uh, numbered lines as well. For example, the number 16 train was what we call the L train today. And the number 10 was the M train and so on. So rather than having two sets of numbers, they kept the numbers on the IRT side, but they went to letters on the uh, IND and BMT, which they now call the, A the I got to stop doing that. Uh, they, they call the IRT the, uh, the A division or division A and the B division is uh, separated into B1, which is the BMT and the B2 division, which is uh, the IND. So you have the A division with the numbers, in the B division of the letters, and that, that has not confused you. I don't know what that. Well, but also, like, like, how did they decide what does the letters mean anything? Like, why is the A the A? Because somebody wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell you who or why, but I guess they figured the first one we're going to do goes from Inwood and it goes all the way down. So that's the first one I thought of. Let's call it the A. I, good, good an excuse as anything. To know there wasn't a sophisticated explanation for the naming of the subway line. There and may well be a reason, but if there is, I don't know what okay. it is. Okay. And you can just see all the keyboard warriors now saying they did it because of the. <laughs> Sorry. And perhaps they. Yeah. Um, do we have any um, more online, um, in-person questions? Are there any interchanges between the IND and the BMT tracks and are the rolling stock compatible today? Could they move them across? Well, the IND and the BMT are completely interchangeable uh, because they're built to the same specifications. It didn't used to be the case. Uh, I think I know the question you're asking and I promise you I will answer that, but the IND and the BMT, they operated as two separate railroads from the time the IND opened in the 1930s until a couple of little tentative connectors opened up. The first one, was where the, uh, the, N the N train and the R train diverged just in the tunnel going to Queens. And that's called the 11th Street Cut. That was the first interconnection between them. And then where the F train, after it comes out of the tunnel after church and climbs up to Ditmas, um, that used to be the, the elevated portion was strictly the BMT at the time, the BRT, BR BRT and BMT at the time. And that opened in 1954. So you could finally get an IND train running. Now I'm doing it to the light. Um, the uh, IND line could come up out of the tunnel, run over BMT tracks and down to Coney Island. But I think the question you were asking is the IRT versus the B division. It wasn't. Well, I'm gonna give you a second answer for that. There are four connections where the narrower IRT trains can operate uh, or can physically use the tracks of the B division. And they would do that, that we'd never do it in passenger service because there's about an eight inch gap between the train and the platform. But uh, there's a flyover ramp at 207th Street in, uh, in Inwood going into the 207th Street yard from the number one train. There's another flyover ramp from uh, Kingsbridge Road into the uh, concourse yard in the Bronx. Um, there's uh, an interesting uh, why in uh, Brooklyn 
going into the um, uh, Linden track maintenance complex for the number three train and the L train uh, mix. In fact, you, you probably saw it up on the screen earlier. And the fourth one is the seven and the N at the Queensboro Plaza. And that is the only connection between the number seven and the rest of the system. So if a train wants to, uh, needs to get moved off the seven for whatever reason, it has to move on to the N, go through the 60th Street Tunnel and make a zillion moves before it gets where it's going, so. Thank you, very well. Um, and of course we are both online and in person and able to see these very fabulous um, illustrations. So thank you, thank you so much for sharing that. Preview. Glad to do it. By the way, the images that, are, that you're seeing up here now, these are all the Manhattan elevated that are long gone and that's going to be special to the, uh, the next edition of the book, so. They're a big fan of the second, third, sixth, and ninth Avenue Wells. That's them. Well, it sounds like the 2023 book is a definitely a book to get. Um, this is an online, another online question. Um, what's the origin of the term chaining as a type of measurement in this context? A chain was literally a piece of chain, a 100-foot surveyor's chain. And the term has carried into railroading and civil engineering beyond that. But it used to be an actual length of metal chain 100 feet long. And I think surveyor's chains were 66 feet long. I could be mistaken, but in railroading, it's 100 foot. So you'll see, you might see on a, on a pillar spray painted on, you might see 174 plus 76. That would be 174, 100 foot lengths of chain and 76 feet. Right. Thank you. What is the deepest subway station in New York City? 181st Street on the one. Okay. 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 Um, Don't ask me what the second deepest is because I couldn't tell okay. you. But that's <laughs> a trivia question. The highest uh, is Smith Knife. Right. Um, do we have, okay, we have an in person question. One of my fascinating things, I'm a born and bred New Yorker and a total subway, was a total subway, not like you many years ago, but is the, uh, where the uh, number one train went across to Grand Central, which is now the shuttle. And I was wondering what you thought of the changes they just made to the platforms, the fact that they eliminated that great part where you could see the number one train come around and meet the, uh, Meet the shell tracks. That was always a lot of fun. Yeah. You're talking about the Long Acre Curve. <sighs> okay, for this, from the point of view of somebody who would have to ride the shuttle, what they've done now is truly beautiful. And it allows the connection to the IND at 6th Avenue. The platforms are wide. The trains are longer. From the point of view of, a, of someone who, who taps their Omni card to ride the system, what they've done to the shuttle is absolutely amazing. From the point of view of a rail fan, well, that used to be my favorite place in the world to go in the subway system. I would just stand there on that bridge between one track and four track, where you could almost stick your hand out and shake hands with the motorman of a one train going northbound. And I miss that. That was, I still got a number of photographs and uh, the loss of that was uh, very near and dear to my heart. I think uh, he has a follow-up question. Oh, I beg your pardon, Alex. That is a fake rail in the ground. I saw that too. Yeah, just yep. to give you the thing what it's where it used to be. But yeah, the, the, especially on the east side. That, yes. That complex is much nicer. You don't get pushed over and run over when the two trains, when they were like in rush hour, when two trains would come in, they would come rushing. Yeah, and I got to say, like I said, from the point of view as someone who actually does ride the system from time to time, very infrequently, but from time to time, having just a two-track, six-car train makes all the sense in the world. Having it with tracks one, three, and four previously, yeah, kind of had to do it given the, the engineering limitations of the day. By the way, there once was a two-track, uh, disappeared a long time ago after they severed the connection. But, yeah. Um, right. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a very topical question. Uh, will you add the Grand Central, Metro North, Penn Station, L-I-I-R? This is from James online. What is the question? Oh, I'm sorry. 
Will you add the Grand Central yeah. uh, Station, well, Metro North, Penn Station, and the LIRR? Well, the uh, uh, Penn Station and uh, Grand Central are currently in the existing books, and they have been for about 10 years. Um, as of this moment, I do not have the track plans for the, uh, the East Side Access Project, otherwise they would have been drawn. Uh, the format of the book is pretty much set in stone right now. I don't think I would have to add two pages and I don't think I have enough material to do it. So if I get those track plans, they will appear in 2024. But uh, the uh, upper and lower level of Grand Central and the Park Avenue Tunnel are in there and uh, Penn Station is in there for sure. Where it goes from beyond that, I'm not sure. I will not be adding uh, all of the tracks for Metro North or Long Island Railroad or NJT or anything like that. Uh, for a very practical reason, well, for several reasons. First of all, the book's focus is tracks of the New York City subway, not tracks in the New York, greater New York area. It would make the book just too massive. It wouldn't be affordable given what would have to be done in color as it is. It's, it's a pretty pricey book right now. Um, and the biggest reason is that the scale that I use is best suited for something where stations are, you know, half a mile apart. You know, you get little stations dotting every, you know, every half mile, every three quarter mile. There are on conventional mainline railroads, it's many miles between the station and the scale would just be so wildly exaggerated that it really wouldn't translate into an eight and a half by 11 format book. I mean, I guess if I could go to, uh, to you know, full blueprint size sheets, it might make more sense. But in the format that I have now, I don't think it would work very well and I have no plans to do it at the moment. Okay, understandably, understandably so. Um, do we have another in-person question? Um, thanks for such a great talk. That was really interesting hearing about pleasure, how you, you collected all that information. I'm curious, um, you said you um, like sifted through a, a lot of plans that you got from people. Um, do you know what those um, kind of drawings were originally for? Were there engineering purposes or for training drivers or... Um, MTA workers, something Most like that? Most of the stuff that I got was for the signal, uh, for people in signaling. They showed uh, the location of uh, signal control lines, for example, the placement of automatic signals, um, certain, uh, well, it showed every signal, not all of which are relevant to what's in the book. The only signals that I show are the facing point home signals where there's a choice of routes to be taken. But every sig single signal, ah, uh, is covered in there, and that's that's what's in those those drawings, and the control lines for each one, and notes and everything else. Um, it's a wealth of information, but maybe 0.001% of my readers would would grok it. So I decided I was just going to distill that down into uh, something a little more digestible. I'm just going to take um, two more online questions, and I know that our audience here will also have an opportunity, of course, to speak uh, informally to Peter afterwards. Uh, this is from Thomas. When and why was the system taken over by the city from private owners? Oh, boy. I might make some enemies with this one. Um, as I said earlier, there were three, uh, two public uh, excuse me, two private traction companies, the uh, Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company, which later became the BMT after the Melbourne Street wreck, emerged from bankruptcy in 2023 as the BMT. And you had the IRT, which was the original system by August Belmont. Um, the city at the time, the mayor of the city was, uh, was Highland. I think his name was John Highland. And uh, at one point he was working when he was going to law school, or at least so the story goes, I don't know. And didn't do any research to prove this, but the story goes that he was working as, as a motorman on the, uh, the BRT and he almost hit somebody and they fired him for it. And uh, in fact, I think it was a supervisor that he almost hit, come to think of it. They fired him for it and he held a grudge for a very long time. And he vowed as he had, uh, got into public life that he would bankrupt the private traction industry. So when he became mayor, in fact, before he became mayor, he, him and his cohorts, they were banging the drums for uh, privatizing public transportation in the city and specifically uh, freezing out uh, from public funds, the private companies. So what they did 
They couldn't stop the dual contract operators, the BRT, BMT, and the, uh, the IRT from operating, but what they could do politically was keep the fare at a nickel and starve them. And by 1940, uh, they made them an offer they couldn't refuse, and uh, the IRT and uh, the BMT uh, sold out to the city and uh, formed the, uh, the current system as we know. So that's kind of what happened. Well, that was fascinating. I didn't know any of that. The, the history is a lot deeper than that. That's just kind of a 30,000 foot well, overview. A, a great overview. Uh, this will be our final question. Um, can you tell us about the train track running, running under the Waldorf Astoria? Okay, there's a lot of tracks running underneath the Waldorf Astoria. That's called Metro North. But I think I know what he's, what he's referring to. There is a, a yard underneath there. This is covered in, uh, covered in my book in quite a bit of detail. What he's, what he's referring to is what's known as Track 61. And there's an interesting story behind track 61 that back in the days of FDR, he would take his private rail car uh, into the basement of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And there was this track, track number 61, that had a platform right beside it. And there was an elevator that supposedly went right up. At the time, J uh, uh, FDR didn't want people to know he was disabled. So he would take the train into this, into this private track and get into the Waldorf Astoria that way. The track is still there. Um, there was a boxcar that people had thought uh, quite erroneously was uh, from that era. It wasn't, it was just a spare piece of rolling equipment. That's up at a museum in Connecticut right now. But uh, track 61 is uh, no longer really used for much. It's not a storage layup, but the connection, as far as I know, is still there. I, I don't know for sure. I don't know anybody. I have no contracts, uh, contacts at Metro North, but I'm pretty sure that the uh, if there ever was an elevator that it's uh, been maintained. I can't prove it. I don't know. It's still there. And I think uh, gentlemen have one more question here. Last couple of years, I've been walking a lot in uh, Sunset Park well, waterfront area. So I was interested to see your South Brooklyn Railway uh, yes. piece added here. And uh, you know, I, I was hoping maybe in the future you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, I think the Coastal Railway, but then I see you have a reference to uh, the Goldstein source, and I expect we can find what I'm oh, looking he, for there. His research is unbelievable. And if you go onto that website, you're going to be there for days. Um, I wish my research was in depth as his, uh, but uh, we chatted briefly via email. He gave me permission to use a couple of uh, bits of information, track plans, et cetera. And you'll find those, I think, on 114, 115. I'm not sure. The page numbers might have changed from year to year. But I do have the entire South Brooklyn uh, from circa 1960 mapped out in there. And it didn't really change much from the 30s to the 60s, other than the sub through second. There's a lot revenue. still on the ground. There What's see. that? There's a lot still on the ground to see. Not as much as there used to be, because mm. Costco obliterated most of it. Yeah, but it, well, kind of under under the street. Yes. Peeking out. Yes. Um, that, uh, that will conclude um, our talk, Peter. Um, I just want to express our huge appreciation. And I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Ernest Shermer, who was, I believe, um, idea, uh, su who suggested this to us in the first place and to say thanks so much. But it was just the most incredible talk to from your, um, the very engaging story of how you became interested in trains, tracks, airplanes, through to, you through to now and the, really the incredible work that you're doing. And I'm so glad you explained about the end design and things because that was really fascinating about how you compiled it and a reminder and, and to hear the hours and hours you put in. And I know that you're obviously bringing a huge amount of pleasure to a great number of people. So Peter, thank, thank you, you for being so kind as to share your expertise It was absolutely with us my tonight. pleasure, Karen. Thank you very, thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.
And Peter, just to add to Karen's uh, comments, well, first of all, the book is beautiful, and it's it's true. You know, there's so when we have our lectures here, I often say in the audience, many of you know this, that when someone gives, we go over a subject, we make us look at things in a way we've never thought of before, and it's always a great gift. Uh, and you really, this is besides your beautiful work. I always, I was. I grew up, my father had an expression, he would always tell me I was born rich. But it was because of the paved roads and the museums and all these things that I had at my doorstep because of things that came before me and people who worked to conceive and produce. So our city subway, you know, it, do, it does so much for us in terms of everything, movement, getting to work. It defines the it city. Defines the, the city. And I have to tell you, you know, and our, obviously our Subway is, 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 you know, getting a, a bad name these days, and I won't get into that, but it, a, thoughts like this make me almost get defensive and say it is something to be protected, defended, and kept for the people of the city of New York and not surrendered in any form. So here's two great days ahead for the New York City subway system, God willing, and thank you for shining a light on the on many lives that came before us. Thank you. Thank you. Before you walk away, we would like to present you with a little memento from this evening, which is the poster. I also want to remind. Oh, that's so lovely. And I do want to remind our audience that this book is now available for purchasing. Um, I also want to. Um, say to our in-person audience, I hope you will join us for a glass of wine. And next week we have, which I think is also going to be another very special lecture on John Roebling. And that will be next Thursday night. So if you're free, we'd be delighted if you join us again. And in the meantime, our huge thanks to Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you.